Hey guys, just wanted to give a brief introduction to this video. It's a little lengthy, but it's a complete walkthrough of the entire menu system on the Sony A6500 mirrorless camera. We are going to delve into each page and each item on, on each page as it relates to manual shooting mode and shooting raw. These are the, the standards most professional photographers will be using. And if you're an amateur, it's important that you learn to use the shooting mode. I will be doing some other videos, getting into some of the settings for shooting JPEG, uh, manual with JPEG, or maybe even, you know, program or auto with JPEG. Uh, so you see some of those other settings unlocked. But for the intensive purposes of today, we're working in manual mode and raw. So we're going to go through each page, every item. I'm going to move very quickly, as I may have already said, because there's a lot to cover. If there's something you need more elaboration on or something that you didn't quite catch, you can feel free to reach out to us. We'll answer any questions you have. You can either leave a comment in the comments section here on YouTube. You can go to facebook.com forward slash batesphoto.net and reach out to us there. Or you can email me directly, daniel at batesphoto.net or my wife, Eileen, at batesphoto.net. So I hope you enjoyed the video. If you do, if you found it educational or useful, which I hope you will, uh, typically these videos you have to pay for. When I first started with the Sony platform, I had to buy a fast start to really learn the ins and outs because this menu system is so different than all the other makers. And even if you're a Sony shooter, uh, the menu is different than it was from the 6300. Uh, it looks a little more familiar if you were a point and shoot or uh, their super zoom camera, the HX400V. Uh, but it's, you know, the menus are great, uh, but they could be very foreign. So this is good good information. I hope you find it useful. If so, please like the video. Uh, if you could, maybe share it if you're a member of a photography group. If you know somebody who may be interested uh, in these types of things, uh, feel free to share it on social media or privately. And uh, as always, we would love you to subscribe. Um, and, you know, give us your input. Let us know what it is you want to see, what videos. We're, we're beginning this series. It's a whole educational series on the 6500. We're going to be doing some field testing, hands-on reviews of the camera. Uh, we're going to do some videos on specific uses, um, linking it up through Wi-Fi, uh, using it under low-light situations, using it as a video camera. Uh, we're going to be doing a whole series of, of applications on it, using it with mono lights, everything else. Um, so any ideas or input or things you'd like to see, please, again, comment, let us know. Until then, enjoy the video. It's a little long. But I guarantee it's worth it if you're, if you're curious about the menu system. You're not going to find this anywhere else for free. Hey guys, this is Daniel from Bates Photography. And today we're going to do sort of a little lengthy video. We're going to do a complete walkthrough of the A6500 menu system. It's a little different than what you may be used to if you're shooting with the A6300. Um, they tried to make it a little more user friendly. They did some color coding up the top here. Uh, I don't know if that's for... Uh, uh, relative recall it's called where you associate colors and numbers whatever uh, but it is what it is so there are people who have a lot of questions there are some new features in the new menu such as image stabilization and their settings within that so we're going to briefly well, quickly not briefly but uh, quickly run through the menu everything we're doing today is on manual mode typically speaking if you're shooting auto you're probably not getting into too many of these settings. The factory settings are going to apply to you just perfectly. Um, some more specific advanced settings. Chances are, like I said, you're not getting into if you're shooting auto. Um, so for all intents and purposes, uh, we're doing the manual menu today. Uh, at some point, I may be doing uh, some follow-up videos with other modes, other shooting modes. You'll see on the menu there are several grayed-out items, and that's because they do not apply to the mode we're in. So we'll be skipping right past any of the grayed out ones because they're not a setting you can change. So starting on page one of the camera settings, we have one and two within the camera settings. Um, these are one of, there's, there's a lot to cover. We're going to go through these. This first one I think is 14 pages. The other one is nine pages. We're just going to zip through them. If there's any particular questions you may have on a specific setting, you're welcome to reach out to me via a comment in the YouTube video, a message on Facebook. Um, you, you can email me directly, Daniel at BatesPhoto.net, and uh, you know we'll we'll answer all your questions to the best of our ability. 
And if we don't know the answer, we'll reach out to some of our pro photographer friends and, and find out for you. Um, so let us begin. First page of the first menu. We have the red camera, camera settings one. Quality, this is where you set your raw, JPEG, extra fine, fine, standard, those are the such. Aspect ratio, this camera only has two, 3.2 and 16.9. Uh, unless you're doing some bizarre landscape shot, I don't know why you'd ever want 16.9, but it gives you that option in still photos. That's usually an option in video. Um, but that's it. We don't have the 3.4. The it's just the standard 3.2, which gives you a 4x6 native print and can be cropped to print any size that's not a 3 to 2 ratio. Um, long exposure noise reduction. By factory, this comes on. I suggest turning that off. Reason being, if you do a long exposure, say you're doing a 30 second exposure for astrophotography, your camera's going to go blank, 30 seconds, you're going to hear that shutter close, and it's going to continue to be blank for an additional 30 seconds while it tries to figure out the noise situation, at which you are useless, you can do nothing with the camera. If you're in a situation where you're shooting 30 second exposures, 20 second exposures, a lot of times it's going to be night photography. Oftentimes you're trying to catch things like a meteor shower. Having your camera offline for 30 additional seconds is not an option. Uh, secondly, Sony makes one of the most advanced cameras on the market. This camera right here is more advanced than any other camera on the market. This isn't a gear war issue. This isn't is Sony better than everybody else. Technology-wise, it is the, the 6300. And the 6500 are the most technological advanced cameras on the market. That being said, anytime you leave any decision up to the computer, it's going to get it wrong 50% of the time. I would rather do my noise reduction in post where I have complete control over it than trust the camera's ability to say, well, this is the setting I need, and then that isn't always reversible once you get it in the post. Okay. Color space, you have... Super RGB or Adobe RGB. Super RGB gives you a little larger of a color spectrum. The camera can only see a fraction of the color a human eye can, even though it can see 10 times or more, more light. Uh, it only sees a fraction of the color. So with the sRGB uh, profile, it actually sees a little bit more than the standard Adobe RGB. So it's wise to have it set to that. Lens compensation. Uh, again, I do my lens compensation post-edit so that I have more control over it. The camera will do shading and chromatic aberration to the best of its ability. I have distortion set to off. Uh, you want to do that. If you have serious distortion, you're shooting a fisheye, you want complete control over it. Don't let the camera make that decision for you. And that being said, even though this isn't a grayed out option, it's not a grayed out option in manual, it's unapplicable because it doesn't do this with JPEG. It only does, or it doesn't do this with RAW. It only does it with JPEG, and I'm set to RAW here. Um, it will try to do it with RAW, but my understanding is it does not do it very well. Okay, down here, drive mode. This is your single shot, uh, multiple shot, uh, bracket settings, all that. This is all the top button of your wheel, brings you to the same menu. We'll go in briefly. So you have single shot, continuous shot, which has high plus, high, medium, and low. Uh, the uh, self timer, which gives you, I think it's a two second, two second, five second, ten second. Um, self timer, uh, continuous, three images over ten seconds, and you start getting into your continuous, your bracketing, and all that. Uh, that is shown to us in this menu, but it's accessible hitting the top part of the wheel. Bracket settings, you can set up your bracket settings. So if you're an HDR photographer. You can come into these settings and say, okay, activate bracket settings, which you can access in the um, in the shot mode. I'm sorry, I'm saying display, drive mode, which is the left part of the wheel. Uh, you access that in drive mode, you can go to your bracket settings. You can tell it to take seven shots, starting with the, the exposure you have set in your camera and then doing three at a progressively getting darker and three progressively getting lighter. And blend that to make an HDR or uh, if your exposure is giving you hard times where you're shooting, you can then pick a better one that's going to be easierly, easier, yeah, easier to adjust in post. More easily adjusted in post is what I was trying to say. Okay, memory. You can set up memories, presets. Um, 
one six hundredth of a second, ISO two, uh, two hundred, um, aperture f4, so on and so forth, and just have that as a preset. Uh, everything I do, I adjust to the situation. Presets don't work for me. That's what these memory modes are, one and two. You can come in here and adjust individual settings uh, onto different memories to um, apply if you want to set up presets. I haven't found a situation you're useful in, but that's just me. Focus mode. Again, this is found in your function menu. You have con uh, single shot autofocus, auto autofocus, which is a bit of a bizarre setting, continuous autofocus, uh, you have DMF, which is autofocus, but then you can fine tune it with your focus wheel. It's kind of a hybrid. And then full on manual focus. Again, this can be found by going into your function menu, and it's, it's, it's a quick access menu. You can access that without having to come into the full menu. Um, these here in autofocus, single shot, autofocus, continuous. It asks you how do you want it to, to perceive, what's the priority. Um, so balance emphasis uh, on shutter release or I guess a generalized autofocus. Uh, by default, it comes balance emphasis, and I think that's, that setting works perfectly fine. Uh, focus area, again, accessed in your function menu. This gives you wide, which gives you the whole spectrum of what you're looking at. Uh, zone, so it breaks it down into a couple of zones. Center, which gives you a small square in the center, or whatever that's over is what it's going to focus on. Uh, flexible spot, which I prefer. It gives you a box, small, medium, or large, and you move the box with the wheel up and down, left and right, over what it is you want to focus on. This is, if you have something where there's other objects closer to the camera, you want to focus on something, but you, you want the composition to be such that it's over here and not center. So now center uh, focus isn't going to work for you. Flexible spot is the way. You move it over to where you want it to be, and you're good. Uh, expanded flexible spot, which is a spot and it's a small area around it. And then lock on flexible spot. So whatever you put that spot on, it'll then begin to track. So they're all good things. AF illuminator, that's the little orange light that shoots out of here. Uh, I have it off by, by my preference. I think it's on by default. I turn it off. You're in a, a dark setting like a wedding and you're taking a bunch of pictures. It, it, the orange light starts to get on people's nerves. And with today's cameras and how great they are in low light, it's not necessary. Uh, center lock on autofocus. I, by default, it comes as off. I have one of my custom buttons set to, to do that, to turn it on. Um, so it, it locks on. Again, you can do that in the focus area with the lock on flexible spot. Um, AF with shutter. So the autofocus will, uh, will activate with the shutter button. Uh, as opposed to if you're doing some sort of a back button focus method, you can turn that off where it will not, the, the half pressing your shutter release will not activate autofocus. Uh, for most shooters, you want that on. Uh, pre autofocus, um, I actually am not positive what that does off or on. By default, it comes on. I've left it on. Uh, my best guess is that is when you have it on autofocus and you haven't pressed the shutter, it will try to autofocus without the shutter even being pressed. It'll try to get you close. Uh, so my best guess is that's what that is for. Uh, autofocus area uh, clear is off by default. I don't know the purpose of having that on. I don't see where it's any benefit. I've tried it. I don't really see much difference, so I left it off. Display continuous autofocus area. So that'll give you little hash marks around the screen to tell you uh, basically within these boundaries is where your autofocus works best. Uh, autofocus micro adjust. Again, this is like that DMF mode where you can manually uh, give it a little bit of a tweak to fix the autofocus. Typically not necessary. If you go into that, you can turn it on and then amount of each way you want it to go or clear the settings. Um, next page, ISO again, access with the right push of the wheel. That just gives you your ISO, you know, 100 or auto, 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 which is bizarre. Um, and then 100 through, in this case, uh, let's see, it goes up to, I believe, 51, 51,200. Then you have the multi-frame noise reduction, uh, ISO auto, and then your 100. Again, accessible 
through the right side of your wheel. Uh, metering mode, there's a few things, center, zonal, much like your autofocus, but this is your light metering. Multi is the best way. It, it takes up areas around the entire shot you're shooting to give you a general overall look at your exposure and, and gives you a light reading uh, kind of averaged out across the shot. Uh, spot meter, you're doing spot metering, center. So when you're doing a spot meter, it's taking wherever that center square is focused on the model's face, her cheek, wherever you're shooting it at, and you're reading only that point. Exposure setup. You have half step or a third step. Industry standard is a third step. That's where it comes set. I would recommend leaving it there. Uh, AL with shutter, that's auto, on or off. That's the auto exposure limit. Uh, upon, much like the autofocus, you have this button here, autofocus or AL. So the half depress, if this is set to AL, will try to get your exposure for you. Okay, exposure, standard adjustment. Um, it, it's adjusted because we're in RAW. We're doing our own exposure adjustment with uh, shutter speed, aperture, and ISO. So that's really not applicable for RAW. Okay, moving on here. Flash mode, uh, you have fill, which is your standard. And if you're using a mono light, like the, the Flashpoint Explorer 600 or something, um, fill flash is what you want to use for that uh, transceiver or the, the transmitter to shoot information to the receiver most accurately. But you have all your standard flash mode, slow, rear, wireless, off, auto flash, fill flash. Fill flash is where I leave mine. Not only is it the most applicable, uh, if I rarely ever, if I ever need to use the onboard flash, but it's also what works best with our monolight system and most monolight systems. Okay, flash compensation minus one. Well, we did a, a um, master photography fundamentals of photography class with John Gringo out of Seattle. This was his recommendation in the real world situations. I've seen where that makes a difference. So it takes all the information your camera sending that flash and telling that flash to do steps it down by one stop and you tend to get a better exposure overall and something that's more easily adjusted in Lightroom. It's not it's not blown out completely. Um, for most situations the minus one works. That's where I leave my camera. You want to leave it to the standard of zero. That's fine. Um, it all depends on everything is situational. There is no across the board right answer when it comes to photography. Uh, exposure compensation, taking into account the ambient light as well as your flash settings, uh, that's standard. Uh, red eye reduction is off. It's really not necessary nowadays. Red eye reduction, I think, causes more problems than it solves. Most photographers are using off-camera flash, and with that, you're not getting red eye because the light's coming in from an angle, not directly into their face. And if you use red eye and you have inexperienced models or you're shooting family shots at a wedding, they see that first pulse go off, and they drop the smiles and blink their eyes just in time for the actual photo to get taken. So you're better off with that setting just to be off. White balance is set to auto. Now they have all the standard settings in here. Daylight, uh, cloudy, you know, incandescent, fluorescence, flash, um, the custom ones. I will leave it to auto unless you really know how to adjust your Kelvin. Sometimes you can use, like, hey, I'm using a flash or it's cloudy outside. Let me do that. That's all fine because you can all correct that post. For white reduction, I'm going to be or white balance, I'm going to be doing a separate video on it. There is a real, real super, super simple way to do a custom setup that works every time and gets it spot on right every time. So keep tuned, keep uh, tuned in for that. Um, that video will be coming up in the next couple of weeks. Um, so auto is fine. Priority set and white balance. It's just a standard setting. Your other options are ambience and white or ambiance. Uh, uh, standard really for for what the camera's capable of again anytime you rely on on the computer it's going to get it right 50 percent of the time uh, just leaving everything in standard for that is going to be your best bet okay dro auto hdr so uh, dynamic range optimizer is is set to auto i think by default uh your other options are off it actually may be off by default or automatic hdr dr or d range Optimization Auto is the best universal setting for that. If you are an HDR person, chances are you do bracketing and do HDR post in like Photoshop. If you don't use Photoshop like us and you really just want to stick to Lightroom for purest uh, development, 
then uh, and you want to try HDR, it's a good setting. It gives you, it takes three shots every time you hit the shutter release, and you get, you know, an HDR picture. It may not be the best as if you did one with seven shots, but it works. Creative style. Uh, this is kind of a fun setting. Uh, you have your standard vivid, which brightens up the colors, neutral, which tones down the colors, clear, it, it, it fixes the contrast and stuff to give you a nice sharp image. There's all different settings here. You can see the screen changing, I'm sure, as you go through them. Um, most of the time, again, that's something I don't know too many pro photographers that, not that I know many of them personally, but, you know, I've watched all the same videos. We've done a ton of workshops with different people. Uh, Scott Lanier, uh, like I said earlier, John Gringo, uh, Scott Robert Lim. Um, you know, I've watched tons of all their videos online as well as, you know, we've done some workshops in person. I've seen Jason Lanier shoot in Vivid once or twice when he was out in the jungles uh, on some of his videos. But typically, we're leaving that at set the standard um, because, again, all that stuff can be done. Picture profile is off. That's something similar. There are some presets in there you can do, very similar to creative style. Um, but again, we're not we're we're shooting in manual. Remember, this video is in manual mode, and we're setting all those things manually. And what's not manual, we're doing in post. Okay, so we're coming down towards the end here. Uh, focus magnifier. Uh, what that does is, for those not familiar, you can enable that. I have it set to one of my custom buttons. So you're shooting a shot and you're manually focusing. Focus magnifier, you can set a little box over like an, an eyeball, for instance, and it zooms in real close. So as you turn your ring to manually focus it, uh, you're getting an up-close, clear preview of what you're focusing on to try to get that focus close as possible. Magnification time, no limit. That means I can, I can tinker trying to get magnification for an hour. It's never going to switch back to the standard screen until I stop turning it or hit the shutter release. Auto focus in focus magnification. So with that on, when you're in focus magnification, if you're shooting, I have it set, like I said, normally that's a manual mode, which is why it's grayed out. I mean, it's a um, manual focus mode. But I have it mapped to one of my custom buttons. So because of that, I can activate it. And when it does that, it will try to auto focus um, in there. Manual focus assist. What that is, is similar thing. It's that focus magnifier without turning anything on. So you're set up, uh, if I was set in manual focus, which I, I'm not, but um, like, I, okay, let me go back to my screen here. So I'm looking at this little vase thing here. So if I wanted to manual focus on that and I turn my collar, it would automatically, with that manual focus assist, zoom in real tight to a portion of this so I could see I'm getting sharp focus, say, on these ribbons here. Um, and that's what that does. It's it's an automatic version of the uh, focus magnifier. Peaking level, same thing, in manual mode. Uh, I'll give you a quick display here, a quick sample. So if I switch this down to manual focus, I get my peaking. So when I turn my dial, there's that zoom in magnifier, right? So I can see right where I want my focus to be. But aside from that, you have, see these orange, these red speckles? I have it set to red. Um, that is your, let's see if I switch this to manual on the lens so it doesn't do the manual. All right, it's still doing it because I just turned it on as part of the sample. But you get that red those red dots that kind of fade in and out. Let me turn that off so I can get a better, there we go. There you go. So now when I turn this, you see those red dots form? Wherever is red is what's in sharp focus. Now I have that set to a low level of it. But that's how you manual focus. If your eyes are like mine, and I'm, they're not so good now as I'm getting a little older. I'm turning 47 December 18th. Well, that'll probably be I'll probably be 47 before I put this video up, but um, sometimes my eyes can't see focus that great anymore. Uh, so that's where this comes in. As that red moves across, that's what's in a sharp, sharp range of focus. Um, so that's what that is. You can change the level, the intensity of it, and the color. It's red, yellow, or white. 
Smile face detect. This is a good one because when you're doing smile face detect, it is uh, it's showing you uh, where the faces are. It recognizes there's faces, puts boxes around them, and it helps autofocus on them. You can also do smile recognition. So it, it, when somebody smiles, it sees the smile and recognizes it as a smile, it'll take the picture. Face registration, you can register people's faces, family members. You can even prioritize them of who you want focus priority to be on. And uh, it'll recognize those people every time you take a portrait of them and then default to the um, priority. So mom's first, the oldest is second, so on and so forth. Okay, guys, we're moving on to page two now. The last video I didn't cut off. I, hit, I thought it was a 29-minute 20 min, 20 limit, but for some reason that cut off at 22, like, 50. Um, and that happened once before to me, so maybe it's the settings on end. But anyway, the last menu cut off at the very end here, auto object framing. It's like an auto crop uh, is all that is. And for this mode we're in, that's not even applicable. The face registration I was starting to say was it will prioritize your faces. So as you enter a family, you can actually assign priorities. And when it sees the, the faces and recognize them, it'll say, okay, well, um, so-and-so is here and he has a higher priority than the other person. So let's make sure we focus on him and the others will fall as they fall. Uh, so that was it. But moving on to page two, uh, file format. This is for video recording. I use MP4 because I upload a lot of content to YouTube between this channel. Uh, we have, I have a spiritual channel. My wife has a spiritual channel. And some other odds and ends. We do reviews on products and things for different people. Uh, I shoot MP4. It makes my life easier. You have uh, AVC XD. And then you have the better qualities, which are the XAVC SHD and XAVC S4K. Um, and all those, you have further customizations. The next setting, you have your settings as far as your frame rates uh, and your resolutions. I'm shooting 1080p at 60 uh, frames a second. And, uh, you know, so all those other formats are customizable. S and Q, this is basically your uh, slow motion. So it'll shoot 120 and play back at 30p, and that gives you your slow motion. Um, there, There's very little... Uh, adjusting you can do in those menus uh you can change 30 to 24 and you can mess with this frame rate but the higher the frame rate the better your slow motion is going to be uh drive speed it's set to normal i prefer normal slow is too slow and fast sometimes depending on the lens you're using is going to give you a little bit of noise and if you're shooting you know this is specifically you see the movie icon specifically for movies you really don't want uh, anything happening that's going to pollute your your video. So uh, sometimes on the fast drive speed, if you have a little bit of a clunky or a noisy lens, you're going that's going to show up in your video. Uh, fast, the faster you move, the more noise you're going to make. Um, autofocus track sensor responsive. You know your options are standard or responsive. I like responsive. It kind of means it's on its toes. It's ready to track at any time. Slow shutter speed. Auto auto show shutter speed. That's set by factory to on. I leave it there because. Quite frankly, I, I don't know that I even use that. Uh, and if I do, I guess I don't know enough to know it. So I leave that as factory setting. Audio recording on. Obviously, you're doing video. You want to record audio unless you're using an external recorder. Um, I use a video go mic, I think it's called, from Rode. It's a small mic with a big dead cat with a red curly wire that plugs into the side. And it works wonderfully. And that's where the audio recording level comes in. Um, when you're in movie mode and you're recording, you can adjust your input volume, uh, your, your gain, if you will. Uh, audio level display, off and on, so I leave it on. So when I'm videoing, I have the little two green bars that are going up and down with the audio levels, so I can see if we're peaking. White noise reduction, or yeah, I always say that, wind noise reduction. You're in a windy area, whatever, this helps muffle the, the, the wind clutter. Um, it does a compression. Uh, marker display, I have mine off. If you turn it on, you can go into marker settings and list all the things you want it to show. Uh, your aspect, bars, grids, safety zone in case you're you're cropping out. Everything for, for post-production in movies, you get all those little markers on the screen. I have no need for them. I find them a distraction. Uh, but it's there. It's a great option if you are primarily a videographer. I don't know why you only got 22 minutes of video at a time for, as a videographer, but... 
some people do love these cameras as video cameras. So you have all the options. You get all those markups, as they're called on the screen, if that applies to your needs. Silent shooting. It's real simple. As this camera comes from the factory, electronic front curtain is on. So you have no shutter at all when you hit that shutter release. It's pinned open and the shutter, the sensor turns on. If you activate silent shooting, you're not getting that second shutter moving either. The center is merely turning off. So it's a center turn on, center turn off. There is no shutter motion. If you have this on, if they're both on, there is no shutter action whatsoever. It's all electronic. Why that's great is if you're shooting a particular situation, you're shooting a wedding, and a videographer standing right next to you, and you're trying to get shots of the bride and groom up there, and he's filming the bride and groom, the last thing you want to do is pollute his video with your shutter going click, 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 click. Uh, it's it's ethically it's kind of wrong you're you know you're interfering with someone else's quality of their work so that's a prime example of why you'd want to turn both of those on and have your camera make no noise upon releasing the shutter because there's no shutter release you're literally turning the center on turning the center off uh release without lens release without card i have them enabled so if there's no lens or no card or no lens or card at the same time you can still release that shutter um, it's good for a few different reasons. I like to do it if I'm getting my white balance up, but the car's not in yet. I can mess around and do that. Uh, if I'm cleaning my camera, I use the cleaning mode, and then I'll actually uh, pop the shutter with the lens off and look in there and make sure that the shutter's moving right. And it, you know, if there's any dust or anything caught up in the shutter, it's releasing it. Um, steady shot, of course, the new camera has in-body stabilization. You can turn that on. And then your settings are simple auto, so it automatically does it. Manual, you can set the focal length of the lens you have on here. I actually have a Sony Zeiss 50mm 1.4 ZA on here, so I set it to 50 for the purpose of this video. Um, zoom has nothing to do with manual or raw. Uh, display button, uh, that's, that's this here. Um, so you can actually, when you hit this button change in these settings independently to finder or the monitor what is going to show up as you cycle through your display so for instance i have my display button once i get the full graphic or i can have just some side things or basic or my little histogram or my level bar so in each one of those stages you have custom settings that you can can set up through here you know standing for the finder what you want displayed what you don't want displayed um, that's helpful, especially if you're like me and you don't like a lot of stuff on your screen. Um, finder monitor. So I can auto, if you put your eye here, screen goes off, you take it away, screen comes back on. Um, in manual, you can map a button. For me, it's C3. Every time you hit the button, it's going to switch from one to the other. Why that's helpful for me especially is I take a lot of shots where I'll be holding it down low and it's close to my body, and the, the eyepiece sees my shirt and thinks it's my face, turns my screen off, but I'm trying to use my screen to, to frame the shot. So I'll switch that to manual sometimes and manually cycle it through the C, uh, C3 button, uh, which is where I mapped it to, and we'll get into that. Uh, frame rate, that's in your eyepiece, 60 frames a second. You can up it to 120, but the camera only shoots in 60, so I don't see the purpose of doing that. Zebra, I leave it off. I, I've never really used it. Um, it's, it's a simple off. And then you have a couple of numerical settings here, 85, 90, 100, customs. Um, I've never really got into using Zebra. I'm not 100% uh, versed on the, the process because I've never felt like I've never used it because I've never needed it. So um, I just leave that set to off. Grid lines, I have it off. Uh, you can turn them on. You get that the basic nine block patterning. Uh, if you're fanatical about shooting on the thirds or things like that. Exposure set guide on. That's that little bar across the bottom with the numbers and the little arrow that moves to let you know where you're at in your exposure. I like to have that on. It's only on in certain screens when you hit display, not all of them. Line view display, or live view display on. You can turn it off. Uh, live view gives you a real-time preview of what it is you're shooting. It even takes into account, I guess, your flash and everything. Um, that's why it's considered an effect. I like it all. I like to see what my picture is going to look like. Uh, auto review, two seconds. That's fully adjustable. Two, five, or ten, or off. 
So when you, you release the shutter, you take your picture, it shows up here for two seconds and then it goes away. Uh, sometimes I'll shut that off completely, but the fact of the matter is, as soon as you touch your shutter release to get to autofocus mode, it, it don't matter how long it's set for, it immediately goes away. Like anything else, like the menu. I, I, I half press, the menu will go away. Um, custom keys. Shooting and playback. This is where you go in here. You can map every single button to a specific thing. Uh, I'm not going to get to all these. These are all the buttons. I would recommend a couple of things. I would never change your factory default settings for the wheel. It's nice to have these. There's a reason they're set up this way. To access your display, your ISO, your exposure, and your drive modes. Um, that's important. I would use the three custom buttons. There's two on top and one on back. And if you had to go from there, if what you know, whatever the automatic settings were, I would then move to you put it in auto manual focus and this button, or AEL and that button. They're two separate buttons as far as the mapping goes, and then your center button here. That being said, what is amazing from the factory, it was never like this before. They have this center button in shoot mode set to auto eye focus. That's been around. That's been there in the menus for several cameras now. Very few people knew about it or understood how to use it. The fact that they brought that on board now, so you, you hit this center button, it'll automatically put a little green box over the model's eyeball and focus on her eye. Because you always want the eyes in focus. So that's very handy to have. Playback, you have less options, uh, but you can map different things. Um, I don't know what you really want to do and you're, you're just previewing stuff in playback. So... Uh, but for instance, the function button in playback mode will automatically activate the Wi-Fi connection to your cell phone so you can send them to your cell phone. But they're all mappable. Uh, function menu. So your function button here, which is so many of your things are in, you can customize that. For instance, ISO exists on this wheel. You may want to change that out for something else. Um, and they're all, you know, customizable. You hit the thing and you pick what it is you would like. Like, for instance, ISO minimum, maximum, if you're shooting auto ISO. I try not to, but sometimes you have to. Uh, the wheel setup. So you have two options. Standard, which this is shutter speed, and this is um, f-stop. You can switch it around to where this is f-stop and this is shutter speed. I'm very comfortable with how it is from the factory. Uh this is set to off by by um, exposure value compensation because when you're shooting a manual, uh, you're doing your. It says it's unavailable in this mode. I think if I try to do something with it, actually no, that's not the thing I was thinking of. But um, so it replaces one of your functions here for exposure compensation. But when you're shooting in manual, these things are dictating your exposure to begin with. So. Um, Movie button, movie mode only, I highly suggest that. I hit this button by accident quite frequently. And it doesn't do it all. It just gives you an annoying message that that's not available in this mode. And um, even where it's placed, you wouldn't think so, but I hit it a lot. And a lot of people have complained about the same thing. So your options are always available or movie mode only. Since this is only to start a video, it's the only way to start a video. You can't use your shutter for it. There's no reason this is it should be active any time but when you're in video mode. And if you're not in video mode, you can't hit it and start a movie. You have to switch it to movie mode. All right, in the last page here, we have dial wheel lock. So these wheels will not work if you lock them in here. So if you set them where you want them and you want to lock it so they don't accidentally get bumped or, or you know changed, that's an option. And then audio signals on, that gives you all your little chirps and beeps for different, like autofocus, different features. And that pretty much wraps up page two. Okay, so we're on uh, page three, which is wireless. Now, we're going to do uh, the next two or three pages here just very quickly. So your wireless menu hasn't changed much. You have your send to smartphone, which will launch the Wi-Fi connection. You go to your phone, you connect it with Wi-Fi, you launch your Play Memories app, and you can download the picture straight to your device. Um, so the computer works similarly. View on TV, you have to have that capabilities of uh, Bluetooth or, or um, if you have a Wi-Fi TV. Uh, NFC, same thing. You, you start that to start that near field um, uh, communication. Airplane mode, uh, if you turn that on, all your Wi-Fi goes off. 
And then Wi-Fi settings, you can get into them uh, to hook up to your router, your Wi-Fi push access point, uh, things of that nature. Um, these are specific things based on your setup, your phone, your computer. So there is no generalized thing with that. Um, I may do a video one day on it. If you have a question, you certainly can ask. And I can do the best to give you the answer that best re corresponds to your situation. Page two is the Bluetooth settings. Um, edit device name, ILC 6500. You can change it to, you know, Janet's camera. Whatever you would like, so it's more it's easier easier more easy to recognize on your network. I don't want to have any trouble with that easy word today. Um, more easily is what I keep trying to say. I think, and then you can just reset all your network sessions settings if you're having an issue, um, and you don't know what it is. You can reset and start from scratch with that. So then, page four now is application list. You can register with Sony, go onto the website, the Play Memories website, and download a whole series of applications. Many of them only work in JPEG, not RAW. Uh, but it comes by default. Uh, the Play Memory camera apps, which is the store you can go to and download other apps. Application management, you can uninstall apps. Uh, but the, the one app it comes with that's actually useful is the remote. And that remote will link to your Play Memories app on your phone and give you full control of the camera from your smartphone. Zoom, uh, Aperture, ISO, everything. Uh, just take the pictures. Now you, when you take them, it saves them to the camera. It'll actually transmit them to your phone so you can look at it. If you're 20 feet away, you can look at it and say, okay, well, I don't really like that one in particular, so let me let me fix this and take another shot. You don't have to touch your camera. Especially helpful if uh, I've shot some people that really, really, really love the camera to be very, very high above them um, for face framing reasons. So it's really helpful in that situation. You get the camera up on the tripod. It's not really within reach. You have to take it down to make any changes. Extremely useful for that. Okay. Uh, introduction. This just uh, goes into a lot of text to, to tell you about the camera and services and things like that available through Sony. Um, and that's it for applications. So now we're in playback menu. Playback menu is only two pages. Uh, delete. When you go to delete, you can do multiple images or all with this date. Um, be very careful when you get into deleting stuff because you never want to delete something uh, you you can't you, you need or you want it. Um, multiple images. You do that. You actually there's something on the card so I can't show you, but you go through and each, you scroll through the image. Each image has a little box that when you hit this button, you put a little check on marking that for deletion. Very handy if you're trying to call your photos after a big event on the ride home or something. You just want to get started. You can, uh, if you're a passenger or you're in a hotel room um, and you don't want to, you don't want to use what you want to use your main workstation at home. You can use that to go through and call some of the images uh, to, to lighten the load once you're home. Uh, view mode, it shows you uh, basically when you go to play, it's going to show everything from that date, everything from that folder. Uh, do you want to show only videos, MP4, such and such? So um, by default, that's set the date view, so everything you, you've taken that day will show up. But as you scroll through, you'll get into the other ones as well. Uh, image indexing, 12 images or 30 images, that's the little boxes if you do like a thumbnail page. Uh, display rotation automatic, obviously, you want that. So if if you taking a picture vertically or horizontally, you want it, when you're scrolling through, you want it to automatically change so you can see it and don't have to turn the camera. Uh, if you do a vertical image and you do turn the camera, it will rotate automatically so you can see it full frame. Slideshow, you can start a slideshow with the images you have on your camera. Useful if you're hooking up with a uh, HDMI cable to a TV. You can just play the slideshow and, and have it go. And then rotate, you can actually rotate a picture in camera. Um, you can rotate it to suit your needs if you took it one way but it didn't work out. Okay. And then enlarge image, which is basically zoom in. Um, you hit this and it'll go in, but also if you hit the center button here on playback, the autofocus AEL button, it will also zoom in for you. Protect it, you can mark an image to protect it from deletion so it can't accidentally get deleted. Specified printing, um, you can you can select multiple images and then do a print setting and say, uh, 
you know, whether it be, um, see, again, I have no images, so I can't really show you, but it, it sets a default uh, parameter. Okay, so now we're getting into the last um, section. Uh, this one isn't as extensive as camera one, but just as important. We have nine pages to this one. So you have monitor brightness manual, viewfinder brightness manual. There really isn't an auto setting to this. Like you, you have sunny weather, which just pins it out at max brightness, but there is no auto setting for this. Um, so you come down here and you, you hit the center button and you change what your settings. This particular screen isn't very, very bright. It's probably as bright as H6300. I was hoping they would have upped that a little bit. Same to viewfinder, you change your brightness in there. Uh, finder color temp, look at the viewfinder while setting this. This is, you can adjust it. It starts at zero, you go up or down for the amount of color, your, your vividness, if you will, or your saturation, uh, but that's really just for here in the finder. Gamma assist, if you feel like something's off, you can adjust your gamma um, to auto or, or different levels. Uh, very seldom will that really matter on your camera. That's just your display. Volume settings, uh, this is turning up the camera volume for your beeps and dings. Also, if you play back a video, you can barely hear it, but you do hear some audio coming out of there. And with that all the way up, you can kind of hear it. Um, it's more anything, it's a confirmation that audio was recorded. It's nothing you're going to sit back and, and watch a full video on. Um, okay, so now we're getting into title menu. This is just when you turn it on, it gives you that play memories title that comes up like a, like a, a splash screen. Um, mode dial guide. If you turn this on, every time you switch your mode here, manual, auto, shutter priority, aperture priority, so on and so forth, it gives you a little display and tells you about settings and um, it tells you about the mode, but also offers you settings you can set right there in menu. So, for instance, um, well, let me go back and turn that on. Okay, then I should switch that to shutter speed. I get this. It tells me all about it. Aperture priority, program mode. Um, and in, in some cameras where you have, uh, if you're shooting in portrait mode, it'll give you a few different, for instance, like scenes. Um, in the old menu, anyway, I see they don't do it now. You can actually select from this screen what you want to shoot for your scene. But I see that's not, they, you have to do that separately now. So it just gives you a rundown of what that mode does, is all this does. Um, you know, for a while you'll find you don't really need it. Uh, I keep mine off. Delete confirmation, cancel first. Very important. Uh, some people get click happy and you hit delete and then you just hit it again. Um, or you hit it again thinking you can go back. And if it's set to delete first, you will just delete the picture, even if you didn't mean to. So cancel first is nice. It gives you that secondary step. You have to physically go down to delete and hit the center button again to confirm that you do actually want to delete that. Display quality, you have higher standard. This is your displays. High quality obviously is best. Power save start time. Uh, you have options here of, of 10 seconds, one minute, two minute, five minutes, and 30 minutes. I keep mine to five minutes. Sometimes I sit it down to set up a shot or I'm working with something or I'm going to get a battery. I don't want it to shut all the way down on me. Um, now if I'm going for more than five or 10 minutes, that's fine if it shuts down. Obviously, I got distracted. Um, I think 30 seconds is a little too fast for me. Auto power off temp. So uh, if I can go a little bit uh, on a tangent here, this whole overheating thing is nonsense. The A6300 has some overheating issues, and anybody who was in the know or did their research realized it was a firmware issue. If you updated the firmware, it went away. My wife's camera had the issue. I updated her firmware. It went away. The 6500s from the start don't have that issue. There's a fear and there's a rumor that it does. Several professional photographers, including Jason Lanier um, and uh, uh, Manny Ortiz, and those, these, guys, these YouTube guys have done their own test. Yes, there's some tests out there where you see some overheating. 
but look at the test. It's not real world shooting. They sit the thing on a baking hot rock within the blistering sun and just sit it there in the still air. And after an hour, lo and behold, it shuts off. Well, of course it does. Um, in a real world situation, you're moving, you're walking, there's a little bit of breeze going across the camera, you're in the shade, you're not in the shade, um, you're not recording constantly for two hours straight. The, the tests were not real world situations, but this has a setting, a standard, and then high. I have it set to high. So in the event I'm filming in the middle of the desert and it gets a little hot for some reason, it'll actually let me go a little longer than it would on the standard mode. Uh, it'll give me a warning, but continue to record, letting me know you're getting close, but I can continue recording to finish whatever it is I'm filming at that moment, getting to a point where I can stop and correct the situation. NTC, NTSC, or PAL. In North America, obviously, we want NTSC. If you live in Europe or some of the other uh, maybe Middle Eastern countries, they use PAL. You want to shoot in PAL if you're trying to, to market this or use this in those areas uh, for video purposes. Cleaning mode. Now, cleaning mode is cool. Cleaning mode, if you listen real close, maybe you'll hear it. What? It vibrates the sensor, so it knocks any dust off. Also, if you've done a cleaning mode, uh, if you have to, if you physically need to clean the sensor, if there's an oil debris or something on there, a fingerprint, God forbid, you have to use a, a sensor cleaning kit. After you do this, the screen shows up. It is now, the sensor is locked. All those little pivot stabilization arms are all now locked. So you can rub the sensor now without damaging your stabilization. That's very important. A lot of people may not understand that. You have to do the cleaning mode first, which then locks it. Then you can go from there. Now, after a cleaning mode, you physically have to turn the camera off and back on. Now, every time you turn it off and back on, there is a minor vibration that occurs. Um, when you hit cleaning mode, you hear a slight and then it goes brrr. Every time you turn the camera off and on, you hear that That's That's a minor mode. But in cleaning mode, you get a much more drastic vibration. Touch operation just gives you options of your touch panel. You have touch panel and touch pad. So the panel is the whole touch screen, and the pad is a one specific area, one corner. Usually it's on the right side of the screen you can use for other options. Um, so that gives you some parameters. Quite frankly, I'm a little disappointed in our touch screen. The touch screen does not even work in the menu mode, first of all, which I'm sure a firmware update will correct that. But um, it, it doesn't do all the things. I was hoping we were going to get a smartphone-style pinch and, and squeeze for zooming in. It, it just doesn't have any of that. Um, it's neat for the touching for your focus point, uh, but it, it's for film, it's instant. You touch it, it zooms right in. For pictures, especially in low light, if you touch somewhere, it just hunts and hunts and hunts and then goes in. So this needs some work. It, it was a nice feature they added. It. Um, it was one of the things a lot of people moved to this camera for, but it, it's not quite ready yet. So hopefully they're going to fix that. Um, this is if you turn the touch pad up vertical. It'll auto-adjust and, and reset itself. Uh, touchpad area setting right half area, so this right half is for the touchpad. Um, again, they don't really have specific applications for these things just yet, so none of it really matters. Um, remote control on or off. I have mine off. I don't use an infrared remote control. I have a bulb. But if you use one of those little infrared push jobbies, you want to turn that on so it knows to, to read to look for it. HDMI, this is just your output settings if you're hooking it up from the internal HDMI cable to a TV. Output ratings, things like that. USB connection, this just lets it know factory settings. When you plug your camera in via USB, it sees it as a mass storage device and allows you to access your photos. Um, automatic, you can do specifically mass storage or PC remote or or whatever auto is fine there's no reason you really want to have to manually change it unless your setup your particular workstation is finicky then you may want to manually put it to mass uh, mass storage device um, USB setting uh, multi or single if you're anybody you know USB 2.0 or higher multi is fine single really isn't something you have to really worry about nowadays and anybody if you're doing photo photo and video editing on your pc you don't have to worry about that setting you have a multi multi uh platform usb <laughs> uh usb power supply on certain again some older models 
Sometimes computers, uh, PCs, don't have powered USBs. Uh, if it requires power, with this set to on, the camera will be the power the USB cable needs to access your computer. Uh, you want that on. It, it really isn't something you're going to run into much. And when you do run into it, it doesn't take much battery power at all to, to do it. So you're better off just for ease of compatibility. You never know what workstation you're going to get stuck working on in the field. It's just better to leave that on. Uh, PC remote settings. Um, still image. Uh, save destination PC only. Uh, this, I, I believe, this is something really to do with um, if you're tethering. Uh, I've never had to get into that. Uh, language, you set your language, date and time, you set your date and time. Area setting is your time zones. Um, copyright info, this is a neat little setting. You come in here and you can set photographer name, copyright holder name. So I have Daniel Bates and Daniel Bates. That puts that stuff right into the metadata. So it's just always there. So if people do get a hold of your digitals, your copyright, your copyright is in the... Um, is in the metadata. Format, formats the memory card. I have nothing on here, but we'll do it for sample sake. Goes through, depending on your card make, card size, and card speed, the, how time it takes to format the card will vary. Anytime you get a new card and you put it into a camera it hasn't been used in before, always format. If you're taking a memory card from an old camera, even a 6300 and moving it to the 6500, always reformat it because there's different folder associations that, that each camera uses that may be slightly different. Uh, file number, series, so it just keeps on going, 1001, 1002, 1003, or you can hit reset and reset it back to 1000 or 100 or 000, whatever your camera uses. Set file name. You can customize. Instead of DSC, you can make it any three-digit thing you want. Me and my wife shoot as a team, so mine is DAN, hers is EIL. So once we then export all of our edited photos into the one common master folder, for that shoot, for that client, whatever it is, we can look through and see, uh, as we then choose what pictures we're, we're offering them, um, we can say, wow, this was your shot, this was amazing, this was my shot, look how cool this is. Um, we can really be sure whose pictures were which. And that's just something we do for fun amongst ourselves. Um, new folder, you can create folders on your memory card. Um, so you create a new folder, you can assign it a name. I like to stick everything with the factory settings when it comes to folders. Um, you certainly can do that. If you don't have the option of using a different memory card or if you haven't had a chance to capture your photos and format that memory card and you're shooting a second client, that's where it may be useful to create a second folder and name it for that client so those pictures are kept separate. Because sometimes the more pictures you shoot, that 1001, 1002 is going to now lap and it's going to reset back to 000. Now you may have, you know... Pictures that were lumped in with the earlier pictures because you looped that series number. Okay, recover recover image database. Uh, if there is some sort of a um, issue with your memory card, sometimes doing this, uh, it'll see it'll check its systems the the file system and see if there is an error or not. If there is, it'll try to recover it. Um, useful, but typically, in my experience, if you've had a, something go bad with a card, it's bad. It's it's tough. There are times it can get it back. Obviously, that's why it's there. Display media info. Uh, it tells you what the card you have in here. You have, in the full raw, I have 2,493 images I can store, or 5 hours and 33 minutes of video. Version, it tells you about the version of the camera. Obviously, 1.0, it just came out. And then setting reset resets all the custom settings you may have made up to now. Uh, obviously, I'm not going to do that because I spent long and hard doing my settings. But all in all, I hope this video has been helpful. I know it's a long video. I apologize for that, but there's a lot to go through. And I hope I touch base. And if there are any specific questions, I would ask you reach out. I'll do what I can to answer the question for your specific situation. Um, this is something I had to pay for. When we first got into Sony Photography... Uh, we actually had to pay for a fast start because there was a lot of settings I was unclear on. Now, obviously, I know the settings and I know what they're supposed to be, and I have actually tuned them away from the suggested settings to what works best for me. Um, so I wanted to get this out there for those people who maybe are first coming to Sony and the menu is a little intimidating or have switched even from the 63 to the 65 and the menu looks so different to you. 
um, just an overview on what each setting kind of means and what you need and what you don't need. I hope it's been helpful. If it has been helpful, I ask you to please like this video, give me a thumbs up. And if you wouldn't mind, subscribe. I do have a lot more content coming. Me and my wife will be doing a hands-on review, a field test of the 6500. We're going to be talking about uh, specific things, uh, uses for the camera, menu items, uh, such as perhaps you know using it uh, Wi-Fi with with, a, with an iPhone or a smartphone. So we're gonna have a whole A6500 educational series. So um, again, thanks for watching, guys. Uh, I hope you enjoyed this video. I hope it helped you in some way. If you know somebody who maybe it would it would benefit, or you belong to a, a photography group with other Sony shooters, you know, share the video. Um, you know, distribute it as you will. Uh, it's it's I think it's important. Uh, to go through this menu step by step like this and really show you what's in there, where to find things, and and just have a core education on your camera that you know what you don't get for free too many places. But this is what we're here for, and you know my goal is is to, is I try to be as pure as I can with my photographs and with the, this endeavor in photography, and I want to share that with anybody who's interested. So. Uh, if you have any interests, particularly any ideas for videos you would like to see done, questions answered, again, reach out to Daniel at BatesPhoto.net. Um, you can comment or message us right through our Facebook page, facebook.com forward slash BatesPhoto.net. Um, you can find me on 500 Picks uh, as Daniel Bates Photography or on Instagram as Daniel Bates Photography or Eileen Bates Photography. And, um, of course, uh, you know, any, our, we can reach us on our toll-free number, 888-460-4800. So any questions, comments, anything you guys have requests, please feel free to, to ask. Please share, and if you wouldn't mind, please give us a thumbs up and subscribe. We will see you soon. Thanks.